Hello everyone and welcome to Remote Rehab's um, first live webinar series. So this is part one of a six part webinar series um, where we're going to be deep diving into remote assessment, remote rehabilitation, um, assessing our patient's capacity to change, motivation, happiness, um, and different treatment options. So I'm really excited. We've got over 500 delegates um, signed up um, for the, the webinar. So that's really exciting. And from all over the world. So um, we're really excited to share. Um, if I just introduce the speakers. So our first speaker is Philly Young and she'll be talking about cognitive remote assessment. Um, then we'll have Gemma Hayden, who will be talking about the agile workforce and remote working. Then we'll have Sarah Sparks, who will be talking from a physiotherapist perspective with her charity Legs and their group-based um, intervention. And then I'll be talking about the practicalities um, of remote assessment in stroke. Uh, so we've got our delegates are are coming thick and fast. So if we um, have any questions, you can use our Q&A um, button to be able to ask questions to the panelists and we'll have the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, so I'll give it just a few more seconds. If Philly, if you wanna get prepared and share your screen, etc. Okay, so um, let's get started. Welcome, Philly. Hi, yes, I'm Philly Young. I'm a specialist occupational therapist for the North Northamptonshire Community Stroke Team. Um, and as Liana said, I'll be talking about how we've developed our skills for remote cognitive assessment. So just to begin, um, I wanted to briefly talk about how um, our normal process works in uh, CST. So we receive information about a patient's cognitive ability in the referral. Um, this includes functional task assessment and on some occasions cognition screens. CSTOTs would then complete functional task um, assessments in their homes and or a cognition screening tool and sometimes standardised assessments to further assess their cognitive ability. So as a whole team, we quickly had to invent a new way of working, um, accessing remote technology to complete assessment and treatment for our patients. Um, and currently we're using the Attend Anywhere platform to video call our patients where able. So other ways that we've adapted. So the ward OTs have been completing more cognitive screens prior to discharge and sending these to CST for further follow-up. And we're aiming to see most patients where appropriate via video. To support the reduced face-to-face -face contact, um, assessment forms have been created by one of my OT colleagues. Um, and this includes functional tasks which involve carers to observe the patient, fill in their form regarding their cognitive ability and feedback to the OT. Activity plans for cognition have also been uh, created, including general exercises as well as functional tasks. Um, this can be done with carers and can also be done during the remote sessions. So benefits and um, the positive outcomes that we've noticed are um, we've actually been able to use the setup of the platform as part of the assessment um, and by doing this we can establish if the patient can follow instruction to set up attend anywhere and if they can recall how to access the platform each time so are they retaining that information another benefit that's been highlighted is that by giving patients the ownership of using the video platform for their therapy sessions it's encouraged patients to take charge of their own recovery so rather than being reliant on therapists visiting them, they have to meet us halfway for their sessions. Carers have been able to take on much more of a therapist role to support their loved ones in their recovery, as they can be used as assistants during video calls. It's really helped carers understand cognitive deficits in more detail and how to support patients in their everyday lives. It's also noted that um, patients can sometimes feel like there's less pressure put on them to perform um, and in some cases it feels that they're not being watched over as directly if it's via video. And as you'll see a bit later on in the presentation, there are ways of using remote technology to assess all areas throughout the cognitive hierarchy. Very quickly, just some barriers that have come across. Um, 
I personally feel that setting up the tech with the patients and carers in the first instance has been my biggest challenge. Um, so this may require a face-to-face -face contact initially where we can do some cognitive assessment and then follow that up remotely. Um, another challenge is deciding whether the patient would benefit from remote rehab or if their cognitive deficit is too severe for them to engage. So in that case, it has been the occasional face-to-face -face, um, sessions. Um, after when completing cognitive assessment, and this happens even in person, um, if carers are involved, they can uh, give certain cues and prompts to the patient to help them be successful. Um, and over video call, this, this can be more prevalent. Um, so it's been important to explain the full process and purpose of cognitive assessment to carers and if they're supporting um, to give them a direct script to read from. Um, it's also been a challenge for a few of the therapists to overcome not having the environment to give certain cues as a point of assessment or conversation. Um, this is where care involvement is really key um, in establishing cognitive deficit. Um, so now I'm going to go through some examples of how we've used um, remote cognitive assessment. So screening tools. So for the first example, using the carer as an assistant. Um, I use the term carer quite broadly throughout the examples. It does include family member, care staff or anyone supporting them. And um, so I sent sections of the Adam Brooks cognitive examination screening tool, um, which needed to be completed in person via email to the patient's partner. I then coached the patient's partner to be the assistant for those sections. So I gave her specific instruction of what she needed to say and advised her not to give any prompts or help to the patient. Um, I then set up a video call with the patient um, and the partner and followed through with the cogn cognitive screen. Um, I prompted the partner to do the sections she had when required. Once finished, she then sent me the sections back via email um, and I mark, marked in feedback later on. Um, completing by telephone. So I have done this. Um, it can be less valid. You can't get those non-verbal cues and you can't fully establish if the patient's getting any help. Um, but this patient I had already, we knew he had generally good cognition skills and he was able to follow the assessment over the phone. Um, so again, I sent him sections via email that he needed to do himself. I prompted him not to look at the questions beforehand um, and to look at the certain questions as we went along. Uh, once it was completed, he took a picture of it all and sent it back to me. So functional assessment ideas and examples. So kitchen tasks, um, these can be done by video call quite easily if the carer is present. So the carer can video the patient whilst completing the task and the therapist on the other end can be given the appropriate prompts if required. Uh, my colleague has started to complete planning sessions prior to their assessments um, with the patient and carer regarding positioning of the camera, what the task is going to involve and if there's anything that the carer needs to do specifically. With these sessions, you can also incorporate attention and executive skill assessment within this. So you can add in distractions, ask the patient questions while they're completing the task and add in problem solving elements just as you would face to face. My other colleague has completed a joint cooking session with the patient. Um, they've both been cooking in their own kitchens at the same time, working through the steps and evaluating the performance as they went along. The patient had great feedback about this. Um, he felt that he had to work really hard because at the end the bakes were rated uh, and they were rated on presentation and rise. So he felt the pressure. Um, you could observe any leisure activities the patient does in their home and also medication management via video and be assessing sequencing attention and executive skills. You could also ask the carer to video the task and send it to you via email and you can evaluate this later on together. Um, it can be used as an insight tool as well for the patient. So attention and processing examples. So you could use auditory target tasks and visual target tasks as well. Um, for example, you could read a story to the patient via video call, giving the patient a target word to listen out for. The patient has to shout out or mark down how many times they heard that word as you're reading the story out. For further assessment of divided attention, you could ask them if they can recall other parts of the story as well as the target words. And to grade this up, you can use more than one target word or add in distractions throughout. For a visual target task, you could hold up a varying sequence of pictures to the camera, asking the patient to pay attention and answer questions at the end. The questions could be, how many times did you see a certain picture? What picture did I show you after the dog? What was the fourth picture I showed you, for example? 
uh, for the divided attention, you could give the patient two tasks to do at once. So for example, a letter cancellation sheet with a target letter um, and listening to a story. So they have to listen for a target word there or recall parts of the story. Or you can ask the patient to switch from one task to another, picking out certain details from each. Um, we quite frequently use attention card games, uh, which assess processing and attention, and we've done these by video call as well. Um, another example, um, my colleagues used a return to driving and attention assessment. So she supported the patient to set up a simulated car environment in the lounge, and the patient's given scenarios to follow whilst completing an attention exercise. For example, move on your hand from gear stick to wheel and put an effort on the brake when certain target words are said. So for memory, um, you could use recall tasks with pictures or recall tasks with um, verbal stories or words. So again, holding up the pictures to the screen or giving the patient five words at the beginning of the session and asking the patient to try and remember these for later. And after a set period of time, asking patients to recall that information. You can assess their use of compensatory strategies. So giving them the first task with the picture, for example, asking them to use chunking or visual imagery to try and remember the pictures and then testing this after a set period. You could also do memory games like matching pairs or Kim's game as well via video. So moving on to executive functioning um, examples. Um, so for a higher level patient of mine, um, I've been sending him weekly tasks to do via email, which have included problem solving tasks and organizational tasks. And on our telephone call, we've gone through each exercise one by one, and he's evaluated his responses and rated himself on how he managed the tasks. Um, it's been really good for his self-monitoring. Um, a patient could give the therapist a task to complete during the session, directing them at each step and stage for a sequencing assessment. And my colleagues have done money management assessments and return to work assessments as well, which could include things like asking them to make up certain amounts of money in change, completing budgeting worksheets, um, computer-based tasks, assessing organisational skills. Propraxia, the Julia screening tool can be done quite easily via video call. So you're assessing their gestures um, and copying of movements. You could set up um, an object recognition task. You could ask the carer to lay out um, lots of household items on the table in front of them, um, position so the camera can see the items, and the therapist to ask to identify an item for a particular function. So you'd ask, what would you use to clean your teeth? Point to the food item. You could complete a task for the patient to watch whilst adding sequencing errors and using the wrong objects, for example. Um, and asking the patient to identify what went wrong, what should have been done instead, and what objects should I have used. And you can also do sequencing picture um, cards as well via video. Finally, visual, spatial and perception um, examples. So we've been sending um, patients paper-based tasks. So for example, the line by section star cancellation by emails um, for inattention and the carer can be there to help um, support that task and feedback. They can either hold it up to the camera or send it back to us. You could show complex distorted images to the camera. You could do colour perception tasks to the camera and ask the patient to identify. You could prompt the carer to set up a busy environment in front of the patient and ask them to put items in different planes and positions to their norm. And you asking the patient then, can you identify individual items in that busy background? You can turn this into a functional task with the kitchen environment. So asking the carer to make the kitchen perceptually challenging um, and then observe them doing a task. So you're looking for, can they find the items? Can they identify objects? And are they using tools appropriately? For example, pouring a kettle, you can assess their depth perception. So that was just a really quick rundown of some examples that we've used to assess varying cognitive domains. Uh, but there's many more ideas um, and many more that are being created daily using the same principles. So going forward, we aim to, you, uh, to continue using video and remote working as an additional follow up to face to face. And hopefully by that we can, we can have more therapy and be having more input with our patients. So thank you to my OT colleagues within the team for sharing their experiences of remote working for this presentation. Um, for any additional advice on how we've managed it, um, or even to share your examples and ideas with us, please email me in the email below or access remote rehab at www.rrc.life.
and share your ideas and questions to the network. Thank you so much, Philly. So there's loads of examples there on how, loads of examples there <laughs> on how you can um, do OT cognitive assessment remotely. Lots of things for people to think about and reflect on and work on. Okay, so I'm just going to the next speaker. Hello, I'm Gemma. Um, thanks, Billy. That was really interesting. It's really lovely to see uh, OTs giving examples of remote working because people keep saying, oh, it's just for speech therapy um, and psychology, but it's really it's not it's for all disciplines to to use and mobilize so uh, my name is Gemma and I am the clinical lead for South Yorkshire Bassett Law Stroke Hosted Network I'm a speech and language therapist and I also lead uh, the Rotherham Stroke Rehabilitation team uh, and Liana's asked me to talk to you today about um, the remote reworking and I've kind of thought of it a bit bigger in terms of workforce and and how we uh, deliver our services for the future. So if we move to the next slide. <laughs> so um, I keep sharing this quote time and time again. Um, I remember when COVID struck us four months ago, um, we were inundated with guidance and uh, protocols and SOPs and risk assessments and this quote stood out for me because um, it really got across how, how I was feeling and how my team were feeling um, that actually this virus has presented our NHS with its biggest challenge it's ever faced since its creation. It celebrated our 72nd birthday uh, last Sunday and to say that this is the biggest challenge in 72 years is is enormous um, but the way that we responded was nothing short of amazing the staff were so dedicated and they were so flexible and they were so resilient um, it was quite humbling to be part of so I do like to share that quote so if we move to the next slide so um, COVID meant that we had to work differently, um, but it also meant that we had to rapidly apply innovation in practice. Uh, Liana has been working in this way for years and years and years, and I feel quite late to the party. Um, but actually, you know, this way of working is not just during a pandemic, it's for the future of stroke services as well. But we had to work in this way um, because NHS England issued guidance and their guidance um, said that we had to step down our community services, uh, that we could only maintain our ESD services and that we could only see people uh, that would fall in a high priority. Um, so that meant that our patients that fell into a medium and low priority would potentially be left with no support at all. Um, so we really needed to rapidly adopt remote rehab and we needed to do it quickly. If we move to the next slide. So uh, my team, who are amazing, uh, were quite worried about this group of stroke survivors. How would we support them? And uh, we stumbled on a system called Accurix. Um, and I say I stumbled on it because just before lockdown, I had to go into isolation. Uh, my little boy had a cough. So for two weeks, um, I was at home. Within one day, I'd got a team member to drop a laptop on the doorstep for me. And I thought, Do you know what? I'm going to have a go with this. And I was sent the most awful guidance that just put me right off. But I thought, Do you know, I'm going to still do it. I'm going to have a go. And, and I, I used Accurix and I made a video call to a support worker in my team and it was the most simple thing I've ever used and I just thought this could work. Um, so I introduced it to my team and they did, they, they flew with it, but not only Accurix, they flew with Microsoft Teams. And within weeks, um, we were doing remote family meetings through Microsoft Teams. So 
we were able to have family meetings in the hospital because we're not we weren't uh, allowed visitors we're still not was restricted on visitors but we were able to get family members to join and be part of discharge plans but we went a step further from that uh, one of the physios in my teams actually set up a microsoft teams meeting and had family members from spain join and I just think that's not something that we can let go of. We need to carry that into the future because more often than not, family members who are local just get invited to the family meetings and those family members who are not local aren't part of that decision. So I think that's definitely something to carry forward. My team have been doing remote swallow assessments, remote language therapy, remote physiotherapy. We even have delivered in-service training through Microsoft Teams. Uh, which again is something to take forward into the future because people have been able to join when it's not been the working day um, but, but they wanted to be part of the in-service. We've had team members who are shielding and isolating who've been able to be part of those and I think it's just been so valuable and something to take forward and we've been able to do um, remote multidisciplinary team meetings so patient focused discussions over Microsoft Teams um, and review caseloads uh, and we're not experts at all, but we're finding our way. Let's move to the next slide. So this is a case study of a 53-year-old stroke survivor um, who was discharged home um, and he, he was just needed some mobility practice. So he fell really quite comfortably in the medium to low priority um, and under guidance wouldn't have met the criteria to have a face-to-face -face visit. So the physiotherapist um, sent him some exercise sheets um, and as we all do with exercise sheets or handout, we put them in the pile on the kitchen side and probably don't really pay any attention to them. Um, so there were further discussions in the multidisciplinary team meeting and it was decided that our support worker would offer some video consultations and it worked really, really well. Um, and he had, I think, four or five video consultations working on um, his mobility and his balance and doing that Atego type exercises. And he was discharged um, from therapy. And I just wonder, had we not had Accurix and had we not had remote rehab, how could his story have been quite different? So if we move to the next slide. So the other thing that has really taken off in our team um, is that we've produced some YouTube videos. So um, I liken this a little bit to Joe Wicks and his exercise programs, but I call it the rehab coach. So we've developed a series of, of uh, videos um, for the upper limb uh, and two levels of chair-based exercises that are more focused on Otago some facial muscle exercises, and we've done a mindfulness video as well. So these are YouTube videos that we can direct our patients to uh, for the benefit of them continuing their exercises at home. Uh, and actually the, the video on facial muscle exercises, we did make that quite a few years ago and it's had over 700,000 views. And it featured in the Telegraph, a patient, um, I can't remember where he lived, but he was able to use the exercises to rehabilitate himself while he couldn't access services during COVID. So all those links are there and will be shared, uh, I hope, after the webinar. So if we move to the next slide. And then uh, I just wanted to talk as well about the explosion of webinars and CPD and training and access to training. I think it's absolutely amazing that we've been able to put on a webinar today for over 500 people from across the world. That's outstanding. We'd have never been able to do that. We'd have, it would have cost a fortune for a venue. People wouldn't have had the travel expenses paid. So I really do believe that that this way of teaching and this way of learning and this way of connecting uh, is definitely something that we want to hold on to. And just in the short space of three months, um, I've been part of and hosted four webinars and everyone's like, how do you fit it in? How do you find the time? And that's the joy. It doesn't take any time. It doesn't take so much effort. It's hardly stressful at all. So I definitely think that webinars and this virtual remote way of delivering training is absolutely something to hold on to and take into the future. Next slide. 
And then finally, I just wanted to share this model with you. So um, this is a model um, called the sense making model and it's how we respond to crisis. Uh, so there's things uh, that are old practice that we've stopped doing, but we want to restart. Um, so that seems like group therapy that we want to pick back up, face-to-face um, -face visits. And then there's things that we stopped doing, that were old practice, that we don't actually want to carry on doing, that we want to let go of. And when I did this with my team, those were things like one-off visits to check in. They could actually be done remotely. Um, and then there's new practice that we started that we want to end. Um, so that's things like we started to work eight while eight in the morning while eight at night. Uh, seven days a week. Seven days a week we'll hold on to, but the 8-8 eight, eight didn't really serve much purpose, we didn't think for our team, so that's things that we want to end. But I really want you to concentrate for a moment on the Amplify. So this is things that we've started, and it's new, and it's things we want to carry forward. And when I've done this workshop with my teams and across the region, every single person said that remote rehab and video consultations is something we want to amplify and take into the future. So if we just move to the final slide. So I say let's amplify remote rehab. We are amplifying remote rehab. 500 people have joined, that's amazing. But also recognise that to be innovative is the ability to see change as an opportunity and not as a threat. This approach will never replace face-to-face, -face, will never replace hands-on, will never replace face-to-face -face training, will never replace face-to-face -face meetings, but absolutely needs to be something for our future that we take into the future to enhance our stroke services. So that's me and I'll answer your questions at the end. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Gemma. That's really um, thought provoking and insightful, as always. <laughs> um, so to our next speaker, Sarah. Hi, just going to pull this up onto a slideshow. Lovely. Um, so my name's Sarah. I'm one of the physios working um, at a charity over in North, um, kind of West London. I'm going to talk to you today about assessment and screening for virtual exercise groups um, from a charity's perspective. So that differs a little bit to the NHS because we have a little bit less red tape, but we also have a significant um, less support and kind of policies. So it's been a very small team, but have made really good strides. So it's been an exciting time. So what did we do pre-COVID? So we're a small charity um, providing neurological rehabilitation, social support and education for those living with a neuro condition. And we were running exercise groups and education and kind of peer support discussion sessions over in a private studio. Um, there would be about a 20 to 30 minute education session and then 60 minutes of doing a group um, exercise circuit, which had 12 stations of two minutes each for balance and kind of um, strength exercises. And then we had a little break and then we did a cardiovascular and agility section. Where we did five stations um, of two minutes and we had a cool down. So it was very successful and really nice bridging the gap from people who weren't quite ready to go on to um, kind of gyms and exercise on prescription schemes because the groups are run by physios they get that extra little bit of support after their NHS care um, has stopped. The model we used to use was obviously people would have a one-to-one -one physio assessment they'd come in for the um, group and they'd do a 12-week block and then we'd do a reassessment to relook at some outcome measures and we were just running sessions on a Monday and Tuesday um, and kind of in the afternoon we picked a time that was kind of going to be suitable for people who were going to return to work and some vocational kind of um, aspects of younger people having ongoing rehab. And we had 10 participants in the class and the cost was very minimal so there was it was 60 pounds for 12 kind of sessions which is great value for an hour and a half kind of input. So we had this lovely space of a studio and great mirrors and equipment. And then suddenly we had to um, rechain. So as a small charity, we were thinking, well, what are we gonna do within COVID? We wanted to keep the group together. The participants get so much out of each other in terms of peer support. It had become a kind of little family unit for them all. Um, and we were very adamant that we wanted the charity to continue and to be able to reach more people. 
um, and to try and help during the COVID crisis where we knew the NHS was going to be super stretched. Um, so we were quite innovative as a, as a charity. Um, we had loads of questions, which I'm sure all of you have had during this time, but we um, worked really hard on trying to act pretty quickly and we were able to be quite responsive. So the biggest things I suppose when we're thinking about what Leanne has asked me to focus on today is about assessment. We were thinking about how we were going to assess remotely. Um, as physios, we often like to be able to put our hands onto people and to assess tone and have a little more appreciation of muscle power and really to look at those kind of functional skills that we have as physios. I think I was quite confident that we were, we were going to be able to do good remote assessments and that's proved um, the case. I think movement screening and looking at people's impairments and pulling out how people move in the functional setting of their own environment has been a massive positive for us. Um, we wanted to make sure that participants were coming into um, the meeting and be able to not be muted. So we didn't want to have a strict criteria on the IT. We wanted to be able to feel like they're having a little social chat to each other and to gain like a, um, a nice social environment from the kind of education and participation. We were really conscious that we didn't want to increase care or strain and burden um, because we were feeling like loads of things were saying well can the carers help with standing with them and can you provide extra support when you're in hospital and yes we were very aware of keeping people safe but we did a lot of work on emergency policies and setting up resources for people to think about how they were going to set up their own environment and Victoria our head of admin was amazing and and she kind of supported me as a physio to support people getting onto the platform we chose to go with zoom because actually it was really user friendly, it was easy to support people with aphasia um, and kind of cognitive abilities and people were using that as their social platform. So we actually thought, um, though it's had a lot a little bit of chat about the encryption and the safety of it, it's been significantly improved and enhanced and all of our participants have been really happy and they now utilize it sometimes with their social aspect and they speak to each other through it as a, as a medium. So that's a really good skill that they've got out of it. We were very keen to keep collecting outcome measures um, and a big part of our kind of focus was to think about how we could um, get some rich data to be able to look at the success and the kind of challenges of um, remote rehab and to look at being able to write that up as a kind of paper and experience really. So what are we doing now with COVID-19 adjustments? So we set up um, a lots of kind of policies and protocols as all can imagine from SAPs and I do half my job in the NHS still so I still have that joy of writing all of the information but I think that was gave us a really good stepping stone to be able to get people up and running very quickly we sent out a consent form we utilize our whatsapp support group so all of our members are on a whatsapp group and they chat to each other we send the resources of YouTube exercises a bit like Gemma and Philly were saying in terms of it's really a nice platform now that there's so many free resources and information and signposting. You can really educate and improve people's self-management. And the participants have raved about that in terms of how much extra resources they've got for um, a bit of effort on our part, but not a significant amount. Um, safety tips and recommendations. We sent out everyone who's going to be exercising um, a recommendation sheet. We went through their setup at home in terms of what equipment they could use to make them safe. We spent a lot of time thinking about adjusting our emergency policies and getting kind of some key, key questions in place about making them think as well. So it wasn't all going to be on us. It was going to be thinking about what is their normal emergency policy. If they were to fall when they weren't doing our ex exercise class and they were doing Joe Wicks or they were doing whatever else on YouTube they were trying, what would they normally do? And we kind of then went through that with them into our emergency policies. So we made ourselves safe as well as them being safe. And we spent quite a lot of time in the initial one-to-one -one assessment getting the setup as, as good as we can. And actually it's still not perfect, but lots of people are exercising when they wouldn't have. And we wanted to encourage people to feel confident and free to move. Um, so in terms of our assessment, we've adapted it quite significantly from our hands-on assessment within the studio. Um, but I think lots of it will probably end up keeping and certainly it's nice that we're now got no geographical boundaries. We've got someone who's joined our sessions from Northern Ireland and um, having heard about it, their physio heard about it on another webinar where we presented. So that's like a really lovely story for us, the fact that the reach is increasing and we'll be able to help more people. 
Um, we take a subjective history, we look at objective outcome measures, and we if they've got a BP monitor and a heart rate monitor at home, we try and get that as we would have done in the studio, or we try and kind of get an appreciation of where they are from a cardiovascular point of view from their GP. With sensory work, we've adapted to think about more listening for descriptive words and observations in function. So what do they do in their functional task if they don't have their eyes? And how do they move objects from hand to hand? Or how do they integrate with a the weight or the theraband? And giving them a percentage of what kind of their sensation is like. Thinking about tone, obviously you can't be doing your modified Ashworth and kind of your kind of more objective measures unless you try and utilize the carer but we were really focusing on we didn't want to do that we can get a lot of tone from our observations as therapists and I think it makes you really observe people in a really positive way we're looking for associative reactions looking at the associative reaction rating scales we're thinking about them using descriptive words pulling out spasm frequencies getting them to keep spasm kind of diaries and responses to more challenging exercises and again, trying to make those um, kind of observations that they were a bit more tuned into their body and listening to that implicit information that comes out of movement analysis. We went away from kind of doing a formal power assessment really to more movement screening and looking at functional strength. So we're doing 30 seconds sit to stand and kind of more kind of functional based outcome measures. Coordination, we adapted like finger nose to so doing finger to a target. Um, you can still do all kind of dysidokinesis and heel shin quite easily with a video camera. So that can give you a lot of good information. Balance, it's pretty easy to do um, outcome measures, but it does give you a little bit of heart rate yourself as a physio. So sometimes when you see someone closing their eyes and they're wobbling on the screen, you have to be brave and give them the education to think about how they're going to do that well. So are they in the corner of their room? Are they with a kitchen work surface? Have they got a strategy to know which way they might fall if they are going to lose their balance and can they react to that quickly and can you cue them into that really thinking about what philly said in terms of you can do loads of things about um attention and cognitive screening remotely and it gives us some very good rich data you can really see the people who struggle with dual tasking and trying to keep the instructions from us as therapists doing the class a bit more succinct we certainly haven't been able to use music like we do in the studio, but again, that's allowed people to listen a bit more to their own bodies and to respond to what they're doing. So that's been a good learning point from our point of view. We haven't been able to be as strict as we would have done with orthotics and footwear. So people sometimes don't want to have their AFO on at home and they have less stability and we've allowed them to accommodate to that and think about how we adapt the environment to help that kind of stability or we've encouraged them to try exercises for part of the class with their orthotic on and then removing it for other parts. So it is being a little bit more versatile and trying to respond to the thing that's in front of you. Um, we've done a lot of outcome measures. So these are on the left are our outcome measures we used to do in the studio. And then from April, we moved on to doing kind of the EQ5D, 30 seconds sit to stand, like the kind of balance sequence there. And we have an upper limb group as well that we're just like starting at the moment. So we've been doing the armor, the motor activity log, motor assessment scale, and then taking photo screenshots and, and then using that for electronic goniometers. And that's a really um, useful bit of technology that again, we wouldn't have done. We would have measured that with a standard goniometer. Or you would have had a feel and estimated an eyeball range whereas you've got some nice photo outcome measures that then the patients can like see as well so the question is is it as effective and i suppose actually what we've seen is our assessments have been very good what we've picked out from our movement screens and analysis has guided us as treatments and be able to adapt the exercises we did this reassessment of someone yesterday who's a 78 year old man with like um left side of weakness and his measures have significantly changed just in 12 weeks um his sit to stand, for example, went from nine to 14, which is massive in terms of strength. He's got um, significantly um, more balance in terms of his right single leg stance going from 10, like 0.65 seconds to 37. So that's a 26 second improvement in a very short amount of time. And that's from dosage and him practicing lots. And I think the confidence to exercise, I think that was really encouraging because actually fear provoking of um, falling and doing remote exercise is high and he went from a seven to a one and all of our fears are reduced as well so I think the data that we're getting through at the moment and we've got a kind of a reassessment process going is very similar yes a few people haven't changed as significantly as him but actually all of our participants have changed in their sit to stand 
all of our participants have had some improvement in their balance and most of them have had a really good satisfaction response to tele rehab we've used microsoft forms i'm sure people have also utilized that as well as microsoft teams where you can have a really good integrated survey and that's been a nice way to capture people's um, responses i'm just going to whiz through this because i'm i'm mindful of time but i think from the positives of telehealth experience as all the other speakers have said i think we've had loads of like just joyful moments in terms of rehabilitation. We've seen people really come together as a unit still. They've got lots out of um, still remaining in a group. Um, they're making physical changes, but also they haven't felt socially isolated at a time where loads of them who live alone and neurologically impaired and were shielding could have been very impacted on what they were doing. Touch wood, I'm sure every time I say this, I think the next session we see someone that's kind of something happened, but we haven't had any clinical incidents. There hasn't been any falls. I think that's because we've invested a bit of time in setting up people's environments and adapting the exercises to the person in front of them. Um, and I think difficulties and challenges, they're all the same really. So thinking about the time it takes, you often need to do a bit of a double appointment to set up their IT and then to think about gaining the physical assessment, um, the internet just dropping out and having kind of progressing equipment and the cost of that. We can be really novel and utilize anything in their house, but sometimes people miss the specific in, um, equipment that we have in the studio. And as a charity, there's loads of free virtual exercises available. Um, yes, they don't have the support of qualified physios, but that's been a barrier for us as well in terms of um, growing as a service. Um, and just to finish, I think one of the highlights is always to hear back from participants. Um, and this always is like, for me, the ultimate thing to know when the services worked and changed. And the fact that these comments have just shown how um, much people have valued it, people have invested in it. I would not have survived lockdown without the legs classes. Um, that just is amazing. I did not know I could run and jump a big thank you. And we're pushing people to do things that they just didn't think was in their capacity. And this is fundamentally, shielding would have meant deconditioning, isolation and loneliness, but with the support of legs, I feel stronger, connected and supported. And that was the three big things we wanted to do when we started this kind of remote journey. We wanted to keep people feeling really connected and supported, but we wanted to make a physical change. We weren't doing this just to um, kind of keep them going. And that's kind of, and um, where we're at. Any questions or um, any more details? Um, all my details are here on the slide and I'd be happy to take any questions um, through the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, really informative. Um, thank you, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to round off by talking about the practicalities of remote MDT assessment in stroke. Um, so now that we're in the restore and recovery phase of the pandemic, in the UK, service provision has been variable. Some teams have been told they can um, provide rehabilitation and some, some not. And as Gemma highlighted, we had a, UK, a national document um, out last week, which highlighted the importance of rehabilitation. And more importantly, it, it did highlight the, the opportunity that tele-rehabilitation and assessment can offer um, to stroke services. However, there has been a lack of training and support and also a, a lack of dissemination of the available evidence base. And so as teams, we've had to make some fundamental decisions. How do we maintain safety for everyone involved, for staff and for patients? And what, is, what are the internal and external influences on that? How confident do I feel as a therapist to do it? And do I have the software, the hardware, the ability, the environment to be able to provide an excellent service? Um, there's also been some decisions about how you decide when you're going to do face-to-face -face versus remote. And there are a lot of documents that we can share around how you make that decision. But I don't think it's a decision necessarily between one or the other. What we're trying to promote as a, uh, the remote rehab community is more of a blended approach. Um, where you do the things you definitely need to do face to face and then you do other things that can be done remotely remotely and you upskill yourself for that remote assessment. 
So the remote assessment can be just like any assessment as it's shown by all the speakers today. It can be one-to-one, -one, um, you can have family members there, it can be part of a group, but the aim is to get some diagnostic information, provide information, advice, and then plan your rehabilitation. But as therapists, we really need to think about the pre-assessment. So we have a discussion with our patients are you going to be doing 100% remote, 100% face-to-face, or blended approach? And it's really sitting with yourself and thinking, how confident am I and how competent am I to do the things that I'm, I'm going to be doing remotely? And that would be the first step in deciding how you're going to do a remote assessment. And then you, as a community, we've developed a pre-assessment checklist. So you'd be thinking, okay, do, do, my, do I and the patient have the technology? Do we have the equipment? Do we have the software and hardware to be able to get a connection and then experience a good remote assessment? Do I have the capability? Does my patient have the capability? And what are my beliefs and their beliefs around rehab? And I think we were having a conversation today with someone who said, you know, for older patients, they may not be, have the capability to access. That's not 100% true. And I don't think we should prejudge someone's capability. It's something that we should assess. And again, with communication, do, we have, do I and they have the capability and confidence to be able to participate in an assessment? And that, that doesn't mean being able to speak. That's just the gesture as well as other things that the speech therapist will be able to elaborate on. On your checklist will be, do I have the right environment? Is it, if, have I looked at all the health and safety? I know that OTs and the physios have started to do virtual tours of people's houses. So getting them to go around and show them because there are cues and things that you wouldn't necessarily see on video. Um, and do they have the physical ability to participate? How long is a session gonna be? Does it need to be slightly shorter? Does it, you know, do you need to do a little bit of the assessment one day and a little bit of the assessment another day? That's all about smart timetabling. And then what support do they need? What support do you need? So I've done a lot of peer-to-peer -peer sessions with therapists where you can both be there on the assessment to help each other. Or does the patient need a physical, someone physically there, a carer or a therapist while you're remotely? So it's thinking through those things and also the practicalities. When, where, how are we going to do this so that you're set up? Once you've gone through that, then you move on to the assessment. And I know our team are doing a COVID risk assessment, which is basically saying there is the, the, the possibility of spread of the virus as we move from house to house and patient to patient. Is that these are the risks. What do you want to do? What's your choice? We can provide rehabilitation remotely or not. Um, and then we have a consent form. Um, that is documented and everything is documented as a normal assessment you would just document that um, you're doing it remotely and you may provide onboarding sessions so I know I've done a lot of sessions where actually getting them to be able to see me on the screen is just as informative in terms of how they're going to cope with the remote a remote assessment or rehabilitation than anything else can they follow a written guide that you've made um, you may email assessment forms or handouts before and share and share your screen or share them. You may email outcome measures and say, actually, we need a chair here or um, a set amount of liquid or whatever you need to be able to do the assessment. And I think it's about thinking about the quick wins. So I wouldn't start assessing things that I wouldn't feel confident. So I'm quite confident with upper limb assessment, visual assessment, balance assessment. That's where I would start. And then the things where I think they need a bit more thinking, I'd move on and discuss with other colleagues. You may think about doing a graded approach. So we were thinking about when assessing balance that you may start stratifying your patients. So does my patient have to do the assessment in the chair? Can they do it with a frame? Can they do it with a stick? Can they do it unaided? And then what do I need around me or what do they need around me to keep that assessment safe? Um, so you may start thinking about it a lot more in your SOPs. Um, it does require a lot more planning um, and you may figure out that actually it's quite tiring, it's quite tiring for you. Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Um, so you may plan in shorter sessions, but that again, as I said, is about strategic timetabling um, and planning in breaks for not only you, but for the, the patient. And getting feedback, how did that assessment feel for you? 
you know, did you enjoy it? Um, it's also um, really important for the patient to get feedback on their assessment. I found that um, my patients are learning about their impairments a lot more because they've had to, when we're doing sensation, for example, how does that feel to me, actually, rather than trying to get kind of caught out by, can you feel, can you feel, you know, it's actually, what do I feel? How, what words can I use? Um, you, you definitely have to summarize the um, session a lot more and put in some contingency. So if the connection goes, or if it doesn't go right the first time, or if we need, we definitely need someone there, is actually not giving up and actually saying, okay, what contingencies can I put in place to make this work better next time? On top of that, there's loads of um, team opportunities. So the ability to be able to do joint sessions. So being Bain myself and, and you know, the disproportionate effect of COVID, I've been able to go in to see less patients, but actually still provide teaching as part of joint sessions or peer-to-peer -peer support. There's a lot more collaboration um, with patients and families and a lot more autonomy. You have to do it because I'm physically not there. And I think we as therapists really try to promote self-management and the lack and the, the diminishing, diminishing of reliance on us for everything. But actually this promotes that in a way. Um, it also allows for modeling. So you're able to demonstrate and talk through exercises and actually see someone um, doing their exercises without you there. And I think um, I was talking to about this today, that actually we're not in our patient's house for 23 hours out of the day. So actually you're getting an insight into what they're doing, um, how they're gonna set up their exercises, how they're gonna do all this rehabilitation that you've set out on your exercise sheets. You can obviously have an observation record. So um, if you video or you screen share or you show within your session, and then you can show later. Um, we're still getting around the IG issues of that, but I think this is the time to really try and get things under <laughs> and around so that you can um, use the things that are gonna help us promote this. And just like you have to plan, it also gives you opportunity to think outside of the box. How am I gonna do a visual assessment? You know, I was talking about this today, you know, actually I can get right into the screen and look at your eyes without getting right into your face. It's just another way of doing things. And there's been a lot of feedback that it's been better than seeing someone through a mask. You can actually gain that rapport and there's been no thoughts that you can't gain that rapport through your assessment and your treatment. There are challenges. So obviously you cannot palpate and there is this feeling that you don't have the same diagnostic accuracy that you normally had. But as all the, the clinicians have said, it's allowed you to upskill on your observation and on your conversational um, in, in, in uh, questioning, etc., to be able to use different types of skills to get the same outcome. And also you're going to be more cautious, especially with things that, that are false risks. You, you may go a bit slower. Um, but as you upskill, you, you are able to problem solve and think about that in a more, more detail. And it's also about engagement, you know, but with all therapy, it's about how you manage that with your caseload, how you manage that with your patients, how you promote engagement. Um, you may not have the same support or they may not have support, which can limit. Um, and some functional assessments, such as ones that involve water, <laughs> may not be the best remotely. So they don't lend themselves to electricity <laughs> and you don't have the same spontaneity. So when I walk through a house, I may see someone's hoarding their medication and then it may change my um, assessment immediately um, because actually that's an environmental cue that you may not get. Um, but at remote rehab and in general with these presentations we're showing you the opportunities for innovation we're showing you how challenges can overcome how we can promote an agile workforce at remote rehab we're also promoting a blending approach we are not here to promote remote rehabilitation over and above anything else but what we're saying is that actually there are a lot of opportunities with remote with remote working and that actually it can supplement and enhance your offer and it's not the 
the um, Cinderella to rehab, it can be just as good, but there are training needs. And I think on the platform and just in general with connections that I've made, we've been able to really upskill ourselves very quickly, as you can tell by all of these presentations so far. Um, so that brings our webinar to a close. Obviously this is part one. So as you can see on the screen, if you go to our website, www.rrc.live, you'll be able to sign up to the next five webinars and you can email us at contact at rrc.live and um, we hope you've enjoyed it. So we've got some, a little bit of time for some questions. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and if all of the panelists um, unmute and sh show their video then we can start asking the questions. <laughs> we do have a lot of questions, so. Um, is everyone there? Yeah, it won't let me share my video. It's saying the host has disabled it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if anyone else is having that as well. Mine was the same, but it's just come back on now. Oh. <laughs> okay, we can still hear you. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, we, the first question is, we're finding it difficult to email videos um, from patients due to file size. Has anyone had any solutions to this? Um, yeah, so when we were making the YouTube videos, they were huge. Uh, so we used an app called WeTransfer, uh, which is a free app that you can transfer quite large data through. Um, so I don't know if you've, any of the panellists, any other tips but yeah it's called we transfer if you google it you can find it and it's really useful yeah i couldn't remember what it was called but you've just said it so that's actually <laughs> um yeah because you can share quite large files with that um okay i think this one would be for Gemma. um can you elaborate a little more on remote swallow therapy how do you go about that yeah, so um, I haven't actually done any remote swallow therapy myself. It's colleagues that I work with. Um, but the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists have issued guidance on particularly tele-swallow. Um, so if you do go to their website, you can find out more information. But from what I can gather from listening to conversations in the office, uh, it's just a, a bit like uh, what the other speakers were saying, it's like observation. So you have to get people ready so they've got different textures of food um, to try and you just watch them. Check, you can check inside the mouth, check it's cleared. Um, you obviously can't feel the neck, but there's debate how accurate that is anyway. Um, whether you're going to get a stethoscope on or not, you know, it's, it's not entirely accurate. So I think it's a lot of observation and but a lot of preparation, like Liana said, to make sure they've got all the food textures ready and there to try. And a lot of feedback, again, as Liana said, so how did that feel? Did it feel like it was getting stuck in the throat? Um, so, but that's how I can imagine it going. I, I must admit, I've not done any myself, um, <laughs> but I've, I've listened to colleagues and talked through it with colleagues. And if you direct yourself to the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy, they've issued some wonderful guidance uh, and SOPs and they've delivered webinars as well. Yeah. Um, so if you, if you do look at the webinar that we last did, actually we had a speech therapist talking about how she was doing that kind of work as well. Yeah, and if you contact us, she shared her SOP on remote um, swallow assessments that she's happy to share. So we're happy to share that as well um, and put you in contact with her because she is so good. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Okay, the next question, how can you reach out to people who don't have access to a computer to connect to or are not computer wise, especially if a second wave is expected? Shall I answer that? <laughs> um, I think personally, like I said in my presentation, is not having um, the uh, not thinking that people aren't going to be able to connect. You know, we uh, loads of um, bodies have shared, and the NHS have shared um, guides on how to connect. The Stroke Association are providing grants to be able to access um, hardware. Um, and if you take the time to, to take someone through 
how they connect. We've been using our rehabilitation assistants to be able to use their time to be able to onboard people to platforms. We've also potentially sometimes have gone in to set people up and then left. So reducing the amount of time we're in the home. Um, so, and, and I have said to my team a lot that if a second wave is expected at the minute, we're using a lot of social distancing to be able to do our face-to-face -face sessions. And actually in this time, we should be starting to try and upskill ourselves so that if a second wave does happen, we're prepared and we're not starting from scratch again in whenever that happens. Um, but even if a second wave doesn't happen, as we've shown through this webinar, there's a lot of opportunities um, to use remote working and rehab as a way to um, improve your offer and your access. Some of the, some of the research actually talks about the um, people spending a lot of money and time coming into hospital for appointments and that actually having some remote sessions actually increases access. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my answer. I don't know if anyone else has any. And um, we've used um, some of the Move More Sheffield resources. So um, they have um, produced a really, really good um, document about physical activity. For people who haven't got any internet or haven't got any um, kind of technology and hardware and people who don't want to change. I know there's stuff that we, we've, we've got grants for iPads for various different people, but there are some people who physically can't deal with the technology and they produce a really lovely PDF booklet that they've made freely available. So we've sent that out to a couple of people who haven't been able to access groups and to nursing homes and that's been really well received. I don't know if you'd be able to share that Sarah and then if everyone, um, if we get any contact on that we can email that out. Yeah, thank you. Um, so next question, I know we're running out of time but I think this is a pertinent one. Uh, how do you identify who we work with remotely and who we have to see face to face? I think that's a that's a big one for people, and I know I have I have gone through that through through the um, through my presentation, um, and it's there are a lot of documents out there that can um, highlight um, what you need, what the patient needs, how. But I think it's just trial and error as well. There's some things where people have said, you know, I can't do that. I can't do that remotely. <laughs> and then someone's tried it and then shared their experience and actually gone, actually, it's not that bad. Um, so yeah, has anyone got any thoughts on that one? I should have to say for some of the, the more severely cognitively impaired, as I said in my, my presentation, that is a challenge um, to get them to attend to looking at a computer screen. Um, rather than you being there face to face, you get that different feedback. Um, so that would be somewhere where I would say, okay, we'll, we'll start off face-to-face -face contact and as that patient potentially improves or they're able to then connect and attend to, to the remote working, then we can then introduce that as we go along. Definitely. Okay, so we are running over. We have so many questions. And um, what we'll do is we'll try and collate that feedback and send it out to people. We'll also um, have the presentations um, to share in a box file and we'll put that out in an email and we'll also put our the video chop top video um, of everyone's presentations on our YouTube channel um, so I just wanted to thank all of the panelists and presenters for sharing their experiences and um, their thoughts and thank you to everyone who logged in on their Monday night and hopefully I'll see people next Monday for part two of the webinar. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.